So let's go back to the beginning of little Lucy. Yes. You were born into a really creative household. Your mum was really creative and lots yeah. of dress ups and crafts. <laughs> yeah. and How do you know this? Stuff? I know so much about you, it's scary. I told you the other night when I saw you and you're talking, I'm like, I know this, I know this, I know this. Research. What was it like growing up in a household like that? Um, yeah, I guess I was always encouraged to be creative and to be very, um, you know, independent in a way. You know, I have got one brother and my parents were both in advertising, but as you said, mum was really creative and, um, yeah, there was always fancy dress parties and crazy, you know, birthday things and, yeah, it was, it was really, it was fun. And we grew up in London, so, yeah. um, you know, I don't know, it, there was a real emphasis on just, I was just always encouraged, you know what I mean? Like any yeah. crazy creative idea I wanted to do, it was like, yeah, do that, you know, and it was very... Mum was very supportive of that and I, I was always dreaming out crazy projects and doing Were you them. like what? I just doing, actually this wasn't even when I was that young. But, um, <laughs> Last year. We did, no, <laughs> we did this, I, I had this idea that I wanted to like direct a play or something when I was in year 10 and we, a friend of me put ads in the paper for like kids to be and we did direct to this, we wrote this ridiculous concert play concert kind of and got all these local kids to come and hide wow. the local hall in your 10 like the local I don't know scout hall or something and had um rehearsals with all these kids and put on this play in a hall that's in amazing it's kind of ridiculous isn't it no, they all paid two dollars and we gave them you know cordial and cookies for their little More morning snacks. tea and we just like rehearsed it every Saturday morning with them over like I don't know three months something and then we put on this play in retrospect I'm like that's insane I was like 16 but I, I mean know, I was always amazing. but I was always a project girl you know like I always yeah. had a project and then you know would you know just oh, I don't know always working on something I never could sit still I was never watching tv I was always making something or you know that I don't know. and so did you write that play as well yeah let's like let's not get too <laughs> carried away it was pretty it was pretty cheesy kind of fairy tale type yeah but yeah it was I don't know I just always was um yeah making stuff doing yeah I was, I was definitely project queen. I reckon you're either like that as a kid I reckon you can tell from an early age if you're going to be creative or not because I was I couldn't sing I never was in plays I remember I was in one ballet concert and yeah. I, I was a pony and I couldn't find my tail and I was doing this on stage and you were a pony. I was a pony I was pretty good at the pony too. and I gave up ballet when I was five like I didn't have that yeah like we didn't do dress ups or things like that like it was me and Humphrey B Bear basically I, you know I think it definitely comes from your family though you know what you're encouraged to do definitely yeah, yeah. and then when you were 13 you moved out to yeah. Australia yeah so my mum's Australian but my dad's British so um there was always we had you know there was always an Australian influence in the house when I was a kid and we had been here a lot for holidays because obviously her side of the family were out here but yeah 13 um there was they there was a recession in the UK my parents right. lost their jobs in advertising it was quite a tricky time and uh, they got jobs here so the whole family moved out to Melbourne then and um you know I sold for like five minutes thinking, oh, you know, yeah. I don't have any friends. But then once you hear, you realise, I don't know, that it was pretty amazing having gone from being a kid in London to being a kid in Melbourne where you just can ride your bike anywhere and it's much, It would be pretty Yeah, different. it was, it was yeah. a kind of, I wanted to be grumpy about it, but when I got here, I was like, okay. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> basically. It's a pretty vulnerable <laughs> age though. Like I remember when I was 13, I was starting to get boobs and things were starting to change and you're going through all of those changes but then moving countries new schools new friends did yeah. you find it okay or was it a bit hard it was a little hard at first I was just starting high school so I just started high school in the UK and it was like six months into year seven you just feel like you're getting your you know yeah. crew and then yeah we came here and I felt a bit like a bit apprehensive and also I went from yeah, schools are so different in London and in Melbourne, do you know what I mean? Like we were right. in a really rough little state school in London that was quite, um, I don't know, it was just, it was really different. Like Melbourne is different, um, the kids are different. I don't know, it was, yeah, the cultural stuff that you kind of don't think about. But um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was fun. I mean, we, I got, it's more, for, school is more formal here. Like we didn't wear right. uniform or anything in London. Okay, it's, you know, yeah, you can yeah, imagine yeah. like trying to think of a good TV show that would, show you what it's like you know it's like uh, central London is quite you know just really multicultural and really yeah, kind right. of ra random and I don't know and because you'd come here which is a very it white felt very country. white it really did yeah. yeah we went to school with just all different kids and we because the schools in London are really mixed 
you know, you do, it wasn't like you just did Christmas, you did everything. We did Diwali, we did like every, because we had kids of every culture in our school, it was actually quite great. Like you would oh, do yeah. every holiday, you would do equally. It wasn't like Christmas was the only one anyone cared about. You You're know, the right. teachers were really, so it felt quite weird to be here and just, it felt quite conservative to go to school here, like, you yeah, know, and right. wear a blazer and I don't know. That's pretty beautiful though to grow up just embracing all those different cultures and it not being yeah, separate. It's just I this know. is what happens it in their quite, life and we'll celebrate that. It felt quite, yeah, natural and yeah, anyway. But I mean, I you know, it was great. Melbourne, we loved Melbourne. I loved just being able to have more freedom. We, I didn't really get to go anywhere, you know, on my own as a kid in London. It was all, security was a bit... Not bad, but my parents didn't let me just yeah. go out with my friends on my own. So it was kind of a, a good time to start change. being independent, like that when you can start going out and getting, you know, the tram somewhere on your own. Yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Catching so was, the tram to Maccas and stuff. Yeah, and just yeah, like, what, you know when you used to just wander around just doing nothing because you couldn't really do anything yes. when you were like 15 and <laughs> yes. you just like, I don't know, go to 7-Eleven and get a snack or it something? It is, it's such know? a hard age, isn't it? Because you're too young to like enjoy the games you used to. Uh, and you're not old enough yet to or other way you're too young to not be able to drink yeah but you're too old to play I those know, games so you just you're so lost. you just see packs of kids wandering like glen huntley you road. do yeah because <laughs> i went to school like me glen huntley road. yeah yeah that many times we would go you want to go get a slurpee I slurpee know. and a killer python and that I was know. like our outing for the day i know it's funny it is so funny isn't it you did um your parents broke up and your dad's now moved back to the uk how yeah. old were you when when they broke up. Yeah, that was a pretty full on year. So my parents separated when I was in my final year of high school. So oh, wow. I, that was 1998. I was eight, I was turning 18 that year. Um, but uh, yeah, and my dad now lives in the UK. So it was kind of, in retrospect, it was pretty full on because I was just finishing my exams and whatever at, at the end of year 12. And that was exactly when they broke up. God, um, but that's actually, quite old too, because you'd be so used to your parents being together. I wonder what, if it's easier your parents breaking up when you're younger so you don't know any different or a bit older yeah. where you're a bit more mature to handle it. I think in my case it was like, you know, parents don't just break up like that like, and it's completely unexpected. Or, you know, yeah. Like, you yeah. know, they, they won't have it for a long time and that's obvious to you as kids, you know, that they're, you know, there's arguments and it's just not working out. And in a way, it was just a relief more than anything when right. they broke up. So yeah. it was quite, I mean, it was hard, but it was like, in a way, it's weird. Like parents were always like, oh, I'll stay together for the kids. But then yeah. my, my brother and I were like, thank God. Isn't that you know? <laughs> I think a lot of them, and I think that's probably a bonus of when you are old, where you just want that, yeah. that yucky environment to yeah, end, yeah, you yeah. know? I, I mean, it was hard, but then it, also mum needed a lot of support. And I think she needed me to be that bit older to not to have a bit of support as well like you yeah. know just things like my brother was still at school but I just got my license so just stuff like having someone that could help with stuff that needed doing in the yeah. car just stupid things that so she didn't feel like the only kind of responsible adult in the totally equation. yeah 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 and it, it brought mum and I a lot closer for sure yeah, yeah. I think it does doesn't it like yeah. I like we, my parents split up when I was four and I vividly remember them, we, my sister and I sitting on the couch and they were on the coffee table and them saying, we're going to, we're splitting up. And I remember not being able to comprehend. So no, saying, hold hands, four. hold hands and that. And I thought if they held hands, that would keep them together. Oh. But then it didn't, the magic yeah. hands didn't work. Yeah. But then growing up with my mum, as you, you know, did as well. Yeah that bond that you have with your mum know, is like nothing else. Yeah. yeah, and it almost makes it all worth it. Totally. She probably wouldn't have had that if they didn't, yeah. if they stayed together. And I mean, it was the hardest time at the time, but in retrospect, it's been the best for both of them. They're both so much happier in their lives now separately. And it's just, you know, it's, they've both become, it just was clear that they weren't good for each other in the yeah. end. And now, you know, it, I don't know. And can you, I could never imagine my parents together now. I'm like, how no did way. you two ever work I know, together? I know, it's funny, isn't it's it? It's so strange. So do you see your dad very often with him being back in the UK? Not as often, really, as we probably should. I mean, yeah, he's in the UK, so it's hard. I do see him every few years. One of us travels, like, he'll come here, or I'll go there. But it's probably once every three years. Um, we just talk like dad's very organized we have a right. monthly phone call oh, do he you? locks me in because he knows i'm a bit loose like i'm you know, yeah but he like locks in a date and a time and then at 6 p.m on because of the time difference as well he likes to lock in the time yeah and, it's so inconvenient people living over there i've got friends <laughs> over there too and they're like let's skype i'm like no i know i'm watching the news i don't have time right now it's always to... <laughs> yeah i know it's always at an annoying time 
But yeah, so he, my, my partner laughs because it's like the phone rings on the dot of 6pm and that's dad. Yeah. At least he's consistent. At least yeah. you know, you can just save up your convos for that. I know, yeah. For that yeah. monthly chat. Yeah, exactly. You studied um, set design. Yeah, kind of. Was it of. set design? I did. I studied, I took a course called, at the time, um, Bachelor of Creative Arts. It doesn't exist anymore, but I majored <clears> in <throat> film um, film studies within that course and yeah I um, there was a lot of kids that wanted to be directors but I was always taking the set design subjects yeah right to, yeah because that's not a mainstream course it or... was not it wasn't and it wasn't a strictly film course either it was quite a broad course like I did it was it yeah it it was at Melbourne Uni but it was um a, a kind of a hybrid course between Melbourne Uni and VCA which is why it doesn't exist anymore but I right. really liked it it was very broad I did art but I also did set design and it was it wasn't really vocational like yeah, you know right. a lot of you didn't you really to come out of that course and get a job you really needed drive it wasn't like it just plonked you straight into it yeah career, do you know what I mean but I think it's like that with a lot of um you know creative not you don't you can't go to school and um learn to be a teacher and then like there's a natural course with a lot of um jobs or careers yeah. that you follow you yeah. know a path but I think when you want to do things like you wanted to do or when I did radio. You can't do a course and then go, okay, cool, I'm going to get a breakfast yeah, show now. Yeah. Like you've got to, there's different paths yeah, to totally. get to where you want to get. When totally. you signed up to do that course, what did you think that you wanted to do? I, you know, I really didn't know. I mean, I I went to a school where the kids were, it's quite academic and the kids are really encouraged to do law and stuff like that. And yeah. I, I guess I knew that that wasn't for me, but I kind of didn't know what was. And this seemed a way to do something it wasn't 100% creative, so there was still it was still academic in a way. There was a lot of written coursework. It was it was 50% written and 50% 50% theory, 50% practical. Right. So we did so we still did a lot of film history, film theory alongside making films. You know. Yep. Okay. Um, so I don't know. I really just didn't know. Like, how can you possibly know when you're signing how up can at you 17? How can you know? I know when yeah. you've got to write your preferences down for what class. I'm just like oh, my sister had to go through it not long ago, and I was like just. Put anything I know that's not good advice but yeah but if I you, think if you just keep learning you just as long as you keep doing something yeah, you're going to find what interests you yeah along I totally the way. agree because you then you, you did though get into film and television yes which is just perceived as such a glamorous industry but I, I know it's so you, far you know from the truth <laughs> I know especially when you're doing set design and making sure it's so, such a hands-on it's yeah it's really blokey actually like set design I kind of yeah, I mean, I finished uni and I started to get work, you know, as a runner on different, like all different mixed bag of stuff, like really crappy kind of cheesy kids TV and then lots of TV commercials, which was really good kind of bread and butter and the odd feature film, which is what I thought I really wanted to do, like, you know, proper features. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a real, it's not that creative. I kind of, I, well, it is creative, but you're really filling out someone else's shopping list. Like I was a set yes. dresser, which means um, fine sourcing props and, um, you know, furnishings for the sets. Yep. And um, really you work, it's just, it, the collaborative nature of it is great in some ways, but in a lot of ways it really, there's a lot of minions and I was a minion. Do you know what I mean? Like right. and there's, you're really fulfilling someone else's creative vision. And, yeah, um, right, yeah. That's cool for like five years, which is kind of what I, I worked for maybe six years before I started to feel like maybe it wasn't for me. And it's really hard to get, I really wanted to get to that next level where I could be a bit more of a decision maker and it kind of just wasn't happening. Film's really hard like that. There's, in Australia, it's a small industry and I feel like the decision makers are kind of pretty set and you'd be, it'd be, there's not that many openings to yeah, move up right. the ladder, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know, it was that weird thing where I, you know, you spend so much time in your early career in film or TV or radio, I guess, trying to get work and desperate for the next gig and trying yeah. to get you make sure that you're employed basically you know for most of the year and then as soon as I got to that point maybe five or six years in where the work was regular and I felt like okay I think this is really reliable now I think this is my real job now I think I can probably stop you know thinking I need a backup yeah and that's at exactly the same time literally that I was like I just don't know if this is everything I want to do anymore yeah, right. you know so it's kind of weird as soon as it kind of all fell together I was like oh this is it yeah, actually this is, yeah like feeling is there the more truck to at 6am and yeah, you know right. that, I don't know it was kind of yeah is there more to it and um and that I had started the blog at that stage and it kind of was just at the point where it really felt like I needed to give it more attention and yeah so you had to make a decision then yeah what when did you what made you decide to start the design files um, 
It's so weird. I, I, I was so I started in two thousand and eight, mm -hmm. and I was just reading a lot of really great design books that I loved from overseas. So there was you know Design Sponge, which I used to love in America, and um, you know a few blogs in the UK. And I was really into reading them, and there was literally nothing, no Australian voice in the mix. And I just kind yeah. of got started, and it wasn't it never supposed to be anything big. You know, it was a little side project. It was nothing special at all in the early days, and um, I just kind of. I guess it was that thing of having the film, having something that was mine outside of the film work, which is very volatile and very mm. unreliable. And it was just my, you know, just the same reason any creative person has a side project. It's just yeah, like that's yeah, what yeah. you do to keep you kind of um, inspired and sane outside of your yeah. day job. And something you can own because you're working for somebody else. You, can, you never yeah, can own any of that. Totally. Tinkering away creatively yeah. on something else. Yeah. In your first year, um, you were nominated for, which I know you don't like. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a long time ago now, but we can no, rehash it. it. Yeah, fine. we will rehash it because it's amazing. But your first year, you were yeah. nominated in 50 top, 50 top blogs, design blogs in the UK Times. Yeah, yeah. That's ridiculously. So you're like, yeah, I guess it was a long time ago. It's fucking amazing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Let, in 2000, Let me was, be your mum for a minute. I think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was, I think that was, yeah, it was about a year or 18 months in and it was, it was amazing. At that time, blogs, to be honest with, it was more of a niche thing. I feel like now there are so many blogs. Yeah. Everyone's got a blog. Businesses have blogs. Yeah. Back then it was still quite a niche thing to do. And I yeah, think... Yeah, you started when blogs, like I remember hearing about a blog for the first time going, what's this? And I remember Googling blog because I'm like, <laughs> what, are, what are these things all these people are doing? Yeah. But you were at the start of that. I was. And I think that's been a big part of the success of the design files is that it was a really good timing. I was kind of at the, the front of that wave. Yeah. And, and so I got a bit of press and things like that award early on and, and just, yeah, I was featured in the age a couple of times. Like, you know, if you start a design blog now, you'd be hard pressed to get publicity really because there's yeah, just so many. There's so and, many, yeah. Yeah, so it was good timing and um yeah, it kind of just it, it really unfolded in a way. I didn't really have a master plan at that early stage. It kind of and it wasn't ever supposed to be a business and obviously now it is. So yeah, it's um it it's it's really just it, it it's amazes me. It's just organically <laughs> grown, hasn't it? It really has. It's the best way to grow a business too, to go, this is going to be my creative outlet, and then to go, I can start making money off this. I know. What point, what was the tipping point where you're like, I'm creating something that's quite unique that people want to be a part of? When did you think, I can make this my full-time living? Well, it's all, as you said, it's been really organic. So I, what happened was I was featuring a lot of local businesses because I cover design and a lot of retail and I'd feature retailers that were interesting and creative. And then what started happening was they would get a really great response from having been featured. And, and what started off happening was a few local businesses said to me, can I advertise? And I hadn't really thought about it. Right. And I had no idea how to run advertising and I just really made it up. I just kind of made some space for ads and like, you know, really, really low tech, just Googled how to turn my column, uh, my blog from two columns into three columns. So wow. I could fit some ads so down the it side. It was yourself. super, yeah, super basic wow. though at that stage. And I just made some room for some ads and I just charged them like something really basic to start with, like just like a monthly fee. And um, that's how it unfolded. And all of, I mean, now five years on, I'm finally trying to actually put a bit of a business plan and some structure in place because really none of it's had much of a plan until now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so it just started like that. People would request advertising, so I kind of made room for it. And I guess that's when I realised that this thing has a commercial, um, you know, I guess that it's that there is a viability there because, yeah. you know, I, the, the businesses I featured had seen a response. Um, but I'm still very... I'm always quite balanced with it and I'm very, I'm, it's, it's not in my nature to be overly commercial either so it's always no. a real struggle to keep yeah. that balance right. I think the power of any form of media is the audience and that's what you've got to constantly remind yourself of and I just think I, I wouldn't want to go to market if I didn't have a really solid kind of like kick-ass bunch of readers to go this is who support the blog and this is yeah. who, you know, so you can tell it, that it feels like all the readers are like my cheer squad and so anything I'm doing there, when I get sponsorship for an event I want to run, yeah. it's not about me, it's about those guys and that's what you've got to keep. That, I mean, that's been a shift in my mind to really get my head around that and, and thinking about the blog in that commercial way. Mm. But I guess I just, 
When I first started writing the design files, there was no way in hell any blog in Australia was going to be a full-time living for anyone. So it didn't even right. cross my mind that this could be a full-time job because it just there was no precedent for it in Australia. I'd never seen any full-time blogger in my field in Australia. So I didn't even think about monetizing it for two years and I think yeah. that was actually really good because I grew this real um, organic, really strong loyal readership base yeah. and I really got their trust before I ventured into that territory and in a way it's harder now because there's so many businesses that are and there's so much um kind of pressure on blogs to monetize and, yeah. and lots of people approach blogs and want to place ads on there and it's not I don't know it's I don't know there's I it's harder to do it your way now because there's so much kind of influence and 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 a lot more um, focus on commercialising everything straight away online now and it yeah. didn't used to be like that. And I love how you said because it wasn't really done, you're like just make it up as you go which I love because if you have a good product that you know is valuable and people love it, you can do what you, you, can. you set the rules There's and that's no what rules. I there loved no about rules. it because I think you you can get stuck in going this is for this this is for this but go just do it no there's no if they say no they say no it's but just true. give it a go. You have done all that you've just recently brought somebody else on yeah do you because I think you know you uh you will admit that you are a control freak when yes. it comes to your work I am <laughs> so did you find it and this person that you've brought on is amazing Lisa, Lisa yes. is amazing yeah, but do is. you find it hard saying okay here's a part of this thing I've grown now come on board and we can do this together I did initially but I have to say it's been a really good training for me too because having an assistant who's I mean, the other thing, when you have a small business, you're sitting next to your assistant all day. So it's as much about personalities and, yeah. and like, liking the person as it is about them being great at their job. The thing with me is I, the design process is such a mixed bag. And so having some, I do everything from, I mean, I get help along the way, but from technical HTML kind of. Do you do the coding on your website? No, but just if things need fixing, you know, I don't do it. I do have a web team that I, to do big things. But you know, when things go wrong, you just have a yeah. little tinker. Um, but, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I don't tinker. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that, and then, you know, doing the bookkeeping and, do, you know, all that. So I guess the fact that I do everything means that anyone who comes into the company has to be prepared to do everything, everything too. They're not well. just going to do admin or just yeah. going to do creative. So, but it's been a really good training ground for me because she is so good and I've learned you can delegate and it gets done really well. And she's only sitting across the table anyway. So, there's not going to be any major stuff ups between here and two metres yeah, away, yeah, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, 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 right. So it's actually been a good training for me to go, not everything falls apart when you give someone something, someone yeah. else something to do. It is scary though, isn't it? Handing it over. I guess now, you, but now you realise it frees up your time and she does it well. It's totally. easier. Yeah, but yeah. to start with, to go, okay. It was really scary. Yeah, yeah I, I bet it would be. Oh, just because in particular what I do, the design process is very tied to my voice. It's very it personal. Is, yeah. and, um, yeah, so it was scary, but it's been amazing. It's the best thing I ever did was hire an assistant. Yeah, yeah. right. What kind of advice do you have when you think, uh, you know, for people starting out in business yep. and backing themselves to do it? Yeah, I mean, I think oh, it's so hard because, as I said before, I didn't really have a plan to start with, but I just think the main thing is discipline because you, any business that you get started, usually you're going to have to juggle with something else, at least in the in the in the, in the early stages. Yeah. And you can't. Tr you have to treat your project like it's your, you know, full time job, and you have to pour every inch of yourself into it if it's going to get get off the ground. Even mm. though, which will require a lot of discipline, because you might there might not be a money earner for a year or more. And I think. There's just so much noise now that so many people are doing stuff like online. There's so many blogs and websites you could be reading and looking at. If you want yours to be the, you know, if you really want to kill it, you just have to pour everything you've got into it. Mm. Just, there's no room for half asked anything. You know, yeah. I just feel like, I think you're rewarded if you really pour yourself into something and people can feel, I feel like with the design files, people forgive me the odd typo because yeah. they can feel the love and time I pour into it. And yeah. it's like, you know I what know I mean? They get behind you. Yeah. Your, your eyes are getting blurry. Yeah, and yeah. I think they get behind you. And on that note too, don't be afraid to put your personality into it. I think the old model of starting a business was always about setting up a front, making it look bigger than it is, you mm. know, having like some 
you know, address, it's not your real address. That, like, you, know, <laughs> you know, that kind of vibe of feeling like you're bigger than you are. But I think now, in a way, there's a real... Um, there's a real charm in knowing yeah. that someone's a startup and putting wearing your heart on your sleeve in that way. And well, I think people also like not like seeing being there, finding you from the beginning, and going, yeah. oh, I kind of supported you from the beginning, and I'm here now. Totally, Look where you are now. There's and yeah, something nice about and feeling that. like they found you themselves rather than it being like this massive marketing <laughs> campaign type. You know? Yeah, I know. yeah. So I think I don't know. I, do, I think I don't know what to. I think any business is viable if you really are really disciplined and just pour your absolute heart into it and make it the best that it can be. Because yeah. Gordy, your partner, is pretty, um, he's very supportive of you yeah, and would need is. to be really yeah. for the demand of your job. Yeah, yeah. And he you is. guys met um, on Thank God You're Here, Seth. We did. I know. I know. We used to, was, yeah, so I was working on Thank God You're Here and he was doing set construction at that time. So we met then and... <clears throat> But neither of us work in TV anymore. And um, yeah, he is really supportive. But, you know, I wouldn't entertain for a moment him telling me you work too hard or you're, you know, you should be, I don't know what. What's yeah. more important? What's more important than, than, what I, than the design files? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> it's not that. Maybe wanted... Gordy is a little bit more important. <laughs> Do you find yeah. it hard balancing though going, okay, so it's good that you go, we're going to have dinner together, but do you have... Yeah. How do you stay connected when you do do such long hours? Uh, well, I work at home, which actually really works for me. Mm -hmm. I've got a studio out the back in the my, in the back garden, which, which he built, built me. You, yeah. um, so I work at home, which is good. And he, he works for himself too, so he gets it. When he's on a big job, he'll work till late. That doesn't, it's not constant for him. It might be a yeah. week out of every month, but he just gets it. He's, I think when you work for yourself, you, you get that you just work till the work's done. You don't yeah. clock off, really. Um, He's so supportive, but I just wouldn't, for a moment, like, I would get so annoyed if he said to me, you need, you work too hard. I mean, if, if I am struggling and, or if I'm sick or something, he'll be like, you really need to Pull just back go to a bed. bit, yeah. But, um, but that's probably what the attraction to him with you was, you know, is yeah. that you are this hard worker and you set goals and you go for it. Yeah. And that, he probably finds that I really know. attractive, even though sometimes he probably wants to throw your computer out there. Yeah, window. I think he does. He, he honestly never complains about it. It's really good. Maybe it's the secret of our relationship. We don't see that much of it. Yeah, maybe it is. Well, that's like Zoe and Hamish living. Exactly. And she said, I think there's a lot to be said for not always living in the same house. Well, yeah, and I think also just not, be, not putting all your emphasis on the things that you do together. Like, he's got his business, I've got my business, and we do stuff together, but it's not like I'm relying on him in any way. I'm very, I'm really independent, and I've always been... Like, even before I had my own business, I mean, I've always been all about a woman earning money and, mm -hmm. and, and being independent in that way and not relying on a guy for stuff. So I think he gets that and, yeah, it's... Um, Which is so important in itself, you I just know? think, like, it, I think it makes for the most equal I do, partnership I, because I you're not too, feeling yeah. like you'd be really lost if you didn't have that person, which just means you're really on a level playing field. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's, he's, I am, I'm lucky, he's good.